right and final string three. Um, so what is expected goals? The opposite definition is expected goals measures the quality of a shot, but I don't exactly agree with that because it's more of a pre-shot model, so it's more based on the chance. So I would type, I would define it as measures the quality of a chance and calculate the likelihood of a goal being scored from that position, given like the type of shot and position of the opposition. Um, it's primarily shown in like sort of these two ways alongside just numbers, then you've got like sort of a map shown by the shots being taken and then like a timeline which can be used for like looking at different like scenarios like at different points in the game, especially with like the time map. Um, what current review secretary, it takes into account your shot location, the shot type, so whether it's right foot, left foot, header, other part, um, assist types, so whether it's came from like a pass, a set play, um, and when distance to like where how that's affected by players on the pitch. So if the defender's interfering, um, or if like the, where the goalkeeper's positioned, but then like obviously the location of the stream players as well. Um it doesn't account for the quality of the opportunity to play the quality, the opportunity to play in their ability. So for example, if it's from a corner and it drops down to a centre half say in League Two, it's exactly the same chance going on expected goals theory that the defender would score as like Lionel Messi would, which obviously opens up some questions and um, it doesn't take into account the quality of the goalkeeper in the opposition it doesn't take into account the match situation so obviously the score might have an impact on how likely you are to score and um, the weather so again wind might affect it and um, the quality of the shot so whether it's whether it's on target whether it's off target whether it's top con whether it's straight at the goalkeeper like the expected goals would still be the same and then obviously the way the way the play's been built up like before the assist type if that makes sense um, so what it does, what it doesn't. So it's evidence based, and the main theory is over three is based on three hundred thousand shots analysed by Opta. And um, it's generalised, so it doesn't take into account how clinical a player is or how good the opposition are. And um, this tends to like sort of level itself out. But Harry Kane has outperformed his expected goals every season since like the fourteen fifteen season when like it sort of first started being measured in the Premier League. Um, it creates like a level, a level playing field to see like the quality of chances that players are creating and allows for comparison between different clubs and players. So obviously, it, it can be used like in recruitment that way. So it doesn't necessarily take into account what team it is or like the player taking the shot. Everyone's sort of level, so then you can compare players on like any on like a level playing field. Um, it doesn't take into account a team's like, style. Um, if you play for a better team, you're more likely to get more shots and have chances in higher XG areas, so then that might make your um, XG look higher, so then it might be a case of, if you're looking for players XG, comparing it to others, it might be looking at like playing style, so percent um, possession percentages and stuff, combining that with other factors. Um, it can give indications where problems like where strengths are, so it might be a case of, if you are getting a really, really high XG, but then you aren't scoring that many goals. It shows that the issue might not necessarily be the creating the chances. You are creating the chances, but you're not scoring them, which is more of an issue than if you aren't getting the chances. Then if you're getting the ball in the right positions, that means that you've got a better likelihood of scoring. So it can help you like, sort of analyse the difference between that. Um, it's normally overly, overly used in the short term, so it's not... Exactly, so it should like sort of balance itself out as things, um, as things start to go on. Um, so, an example would be that Luis Suarez has a, an XG differential um, per season over the last five years of between performance of 3.3 and all performance of 5.22. So, they are obviously at different ends of the spectrum. So, if you were just looking at like sort of it over one season or over the short term, it's not exactly. Um, it's not exactly perfect. It doesn't like sort of give you all the details that you need to be able to like sort of judge it in the short term. And um, um, it gives a good prediction of where of how players will perform longer term. So if you're doing really really well, and um, 
it's like if players are getting the right positions and creating high quality chances, the likelihood is that their XG should sort of level off with their um, with their actual goals sooner or later. So it's like gives a good prediction of how many goals a player will score. Um, it doesn't account for player strength. So Olivier Giroud is like we outperformed his headers in the box. I'm just trying to find the um, figures. Um, so Olivier Giroud has scored 24 headed goals, but that only equates to an X3 of 15.97. So if you were going by the expected goals model, you might not want to put crosses in the box, but knowing that Olivier Giroud is a prolific header of the ball, then that might be the way you play. So it doesn't exactly look at what a player is good at, so he might not come out as having, as like creating the best quality chances because of like the way he tends to think. That makes sense. Um, it can identify areas for concern that would otherwise be missed. So an example of that would be if, say, a player's if say a player is massively perform their XG, then you can know that and pick that up, which you might maybe wouldn't be able to from other factors such as like shots on target or shots off target. So then that allows you to then investigate what's causing that. So it might be something psychological. It might be um, it's get it's not on their strong side. Um, and again, it doesn't give you everything, so it needs to be it needs to be paired with video and a deep knowledge like the team player. So, what is causing that overperformance or underperformance? Um, and just some examples. So, these shots are with an expected goals value of zero to 0 0.2, 0 0.25, so twenty five percent chance of. Eight. That had no that goes 0 0.06, but this one's 0 0.25 from a corner. These have got expect goals of 0 0.25 to 0 0.5. Not point four seven expected goals. Not point five to not point seven five. So not point five ones is like as I wrong. No point six four trial versus Crystal Palace. One of the downfalls with XP is just a number. It doesn't exactly show you what your um like it doesn't exactly show you what's happened in the game. So I like having a map so I can show where our shots are coming from, so then it could help like sort of players understand better what's XG, what's low XG, and help understand the theory, but then also understand where we're getting more success. So obviously on this map here. Yeah, there's a lot more shots on the left-hand side, inside the box. So it maybe shows that that's our strong area to work the ball. I also really like the time model as well, because that allows us to have a look, have a look at like sort of where the, XG is, where the XG is and how that affects the game. So this is Southampton against Liverpool XG with Southampton 1-0. So that ball there shows where Southampton scores. Southampton scores. That was early on in the match. So then that maybe affected their game plan where they didn't feel the need to like sort of go and try and create as many chances. And like maybe that affected the way they played. So that shows maybe a different side of it and how that can be affected like by the time and within the match. Um, so this is the actual goal table for the Premier League up until Saturday. So it does include yesterday's matches. Um, so 
it's got the goals, the XG, the goal differential, which is how many more goals scored, how many more goals a player scored than they are expected. It's like sort of their overperformance, and um, where they are in the expected goals table, and the position differentials so where they are, how many places they would be in the expected goals table. So it shows like a bit of range. So if you look at Son, he's massively overperforming his goals at the minute, which has shown that he's getting the ball and scoring in areas with a lower XG than you would typically expect to be scoring. So he's overperforming. Whereas um, Jimmy Vardy, Patrick Bamford, Callum Wilson, they're all slightly underperforming, but it's not as far as like big of a gap. Um, table. So again, the difference. So you would have expected Jimmy Vardy to score an extra. 0.64 goals, um, and then the naturally expected goals positioning, and then the position differential. So again, if you look between the two, the positions actually are closer on the expected goals than they are on the goals because it's sort of like less. So if you are getting the ball in the right area, you should score more goals. Is typically what it says. Um, and from your XG, it's got positives and negatives to it. Um, so it obviously it's good. It shows that you're from your chances, so um, Spurs, Spurs are overperforming their XG um, in the league for and against, and they've got a combined differential of point eight of eight point zero nine. So they so they have scored more and conceded eight point zero nine goals less than they should have. So um, their place in the league is actually in their expected goals are the attempt, so it shows like obviously if you can outperform your XG, you've been quite clinical, you're more likely to get higher. Um, it suggests luck and can often be seen as um, unsustainable. So if you outperform your XG, it might suggest that you've been lucky. So maybe the position of the goalkeeper, maybe um, just a fluke. So it doesn't like sort of always necessarily mean that you can keep overperforming it. So it might drop off over time. Um, It'll mean you have more points than you deserve again. Spurs, they are five points is different. Um, Man United are first in the actual table at the minute with, 30, with 36 points, but in the expected points table, they are fourth, only with 28.54. And like on the reverse side of that, Brighton are 17th in the actual, in the actual table, but would be seventh in the expected points table. So it shows like they're really underperform where they should be so it doesn't really like sort of reward them for games that makes sense um you can have a they can have a potential reliance on having certain players the areas so if you rely on all tournament if something happens to that player or if they have a dip in form then you're going to struggle because you haven't got like you're not getting the balls in the right areas for the average player to score more goals um I may suggest you find a strength for exploit. So again, going back to Drew, you might change the way you play to suit him because he scores a lot of headed goals. So then although the XG might not be as high for them, that might mean that teams are less likely to like sort of try and defend in those areas. So it might be a case that if you're defending based on XG, you want teams to go out wide and then put crosses in the box because headed goals statistically have a lower XG. But then if you've got someone like Giroud who can overperform that, then that might mean that you're wanting to um, that you might look to try and exploit that. Um, that means you aren't getting the ball in the correct areas. So again, you might not be getting, if you're underperforming, if you're overperforming your XG, it means that you, your shots are better than they should be. So why is that? So if you've got a low expected goals, it likely means that you're, that you're not getting chances in the right areas. So it might be that you're shooting from outside the box. It might be that they're headed from range. So it doesn't exactly have the, right sort of connection with it doesn't like sort of show that you're getting the balls into where you want them to be and um, it's positive as a trend of all performance so if you've got like sort of a lot of players overperforming their xg then it's maybe more sustainable because those players are maybe classed as more clinical so if in the long run they can keep that up then you're going to finish higher but on the other side it can be dangerous if you're relying on one or a few players to overperform their XG and puts the team at risk if like the player gets injured. So Harry Kane and Son made up 61% of Spurs' XG and over 70, 75% of their expected goals. And they're currently overperforming by 6.99 and Son making up 6.61 and 
extent causes that. So it shows that there is a high up performance there and that a lot of their chances are created by those two players and also their goal side shows that they will be at risk if either of those players got injured. And their third highest number of actual goals is two and the third number of highest expected goals is 1.39. So it shows that without those two players, they maybe aren't getting the balls in the right places. So if something was to happen, if there was a dip in form or if there was an injury, then that could put Spurs at risk of maybe struggling in the league and not picking up as many points as they have been currently. So it would say like a drop off in form. And um, the form strategy as well. So you've got expected goals on target, which is like a goal shot model. And it looks best for the scorer if the goal has been down to good goal scoring or whether it's been down to poor goalkeeping. So it takes like sort of their position and things like that. It just, like, goal takes into account. But then it also looks at the shot as well to analyse how many times that goal will be scored. Um, expected goals, expected assists even measures the likelihood that a given pass will become goal assist. So it sort of like measures chance creation. Um, expected goals change, reward chains rewards all players with the total XG of every possession they've been involved with. So if you've created a chance, then you'd get like the expected goals for that, even if you haven't necessarily been the assistant player or the shooting player, you'd still get like a reward for that. And then the expected goals build that rewards all players involved in the total XG with the total XG of their possession, as long as it hasn't resulted in a shot or a key pass. So it more looks at like the build-up play. So it more favors like sort of deeper players. Um so Again, expected goals is a pre-shot metric and doesn't form judgment based on the shot, whereas expected goals on target looks at post shot and then takes that into account. So here is a clip of Daniel Sturridge um, playing for Liverpool, going against Chelsea. So from here, it will be quite a low X3 because of the position he shot from. So I think it was something like 27 metres, more than 27 metres out. So it only has an expected goals of 0.03. When you look at the expected goals on target, it shows that it was worth 0.58. So it shows that that shot is a lot better than it should have been. So then the likelihood of that becoming the goal is increased. So again, this maybe looks more at how clinical players are in different areas and how that can be used to sort of utilise strength. Um, again, we're going to have a little look at the, the actual assist table and then compare the expected assist table. So again, actual, so actual assists... This is the players got and they should do so. If you can see, Kevin De Bruyne is outperforming his by quite by quite a lot. So he should have, he should really only have six point three three assists. But because of the team he's playing and the players he's played, um, four point six seven assists even. But like given the team he's playing in, it shows that they are better at finishing their chances. But if you compare that with somebody like Jack Grealish at Villa, where maybe the strikers aren't as clinical, it shows maybe a bit of a that his chances are better than they've actually been finished if that makes sense. Um, again, shows a difference. There's quite a big difference again, especially if you look at um, Lucas Digne for Everton. So he's had quite a lot of assists from low-quality chances. But again, that's probably reflected in the types of chances he's created. Um, an expected assist table, which shows, again, big dis discrepancies. So you can see that Jack Rich has actually created the best quality chances to choose from. Um, followed, by, followed by De Bruyne and then Fernandez, which you would expect. But also, if you have a little look at Trossard from Brighton, so they are massively unperforming their, ex their expected goals, but it's shown that they're still creating decent chances. So though he's not overperforming massively, they are they are creating good chances that maybe aren't being finished. And same with Burnley, you know, the Westwood. Um, expected goal chain tables. So this looks to favour maybe deep line players. It's like players who aren't as involved in sort of finishing the chances and getting in like in around the box. So again, it's still quite focused on forward players, but maybe not so much. So you've got some more creative midfielders in there. Um, and then if we move on to the expected table, again, that's even deeper because it doesn't include change that end in a shot or a key pass. So if you have a little look there, Rodri's quite high. Um, Full backs, Alexander Arn Arnold, Cancelo, deep line midfielders. Um, but also, you've still got Kevin De Bruyne and Sterling there, so it's shown that they maybe get involved in the build up earlier on than other players. So maybe shows that, although, yes, they are good going forward, they also contribute to building the attack as well. Um, and then just 
to finish on for some discussion. Um, it can be used to be used like key forms indicators. So are we getting the balls in the right areas? Are we preventing the opposition from getting at high areas? How how are individuals performing? How does that look? Um, form patterns play. So could we use expected goals chains and expected build up to maybe look at the pathways to get into attacking areas that will be more successful? So what players can play those passes to get into those areas, which could also be sort of used alongside other metrics to decide that. Um, I would say it would be used in form defensive principles as well. Where do we want to show the opposition? How does this limit the quality of their chances? And where do we press? So with expected goals, it doesn't maybe favour more of a low block team where we let them shoot from distance, but we're very compact in around the box and don't let them get their shots away. And um, forming attacking principles, where and how do you want to build play? What areas do you want to work the ball into? And where will we shoot? And as well, what type of shots? So if you've got someone like Giroud, you might want to get crossed in the box. Whereas if you're going off a more generic model, it might be a case that you want to you want to work it in through cutbacks in the centre on, on the edge of the six-yard box for a tap-in. Um, and then play development as well. How does it how does it influence the way that we help our players develop? Do we maybe um does it influence the way that we make them defend and attack? So is it does it influence the way that maybe we ask them to show? Does it maybe influence where they press, where they drop? Does it influence the runs they make as well? So if you're working with a forward player, do you want them to be making runs that are going to get in high XG areas? How do we sort of balance that with what we need? Um, areas and types of shooting practice. So do you want to develop like a super strength or do you want to develop an all-around player? So with someone like Giroud, he is really, really good at heading. So if you're looking for a good header of the ball, you would likely go and look at him. So he's like sort of got heading super strength, whereas you've got other players who perform to their XG in like in the round where you'd expect them to perform. So it's actually maybe they're more all-rounded and better in those areas. Um, just some ideas. Um, has anyone got any thoughts? Feel free to pop your, your cameras and your mics back on. Has anyone got any questions? I've got a few, but happy to start with other people if you like. Go on. Go on, Mr. Havelock. Uh, okay, Marshall. So um, I, I know a little bit. I read a couple of books. I'm still not sure I, I grasp all of it. Um, one of the, the things uh, I wanted to ask you was, um, so say, for example, um, if you've used expected goals um, to look at one of the games that we've had. Um, is that based on like Opta stats for adult football? Yeah, that's a really good point actually because we use it a lot with, well, we use it a bit with the RDC as well. So then again, it's not necessarily specific to what we're looking at. But again, I suppose principles are maybe, can also like the different factors maybe also link. So for example, with younger players, if we are shooting from, um, from like deep areas, fair enough. Our shot, our shots might be as strong, but the goalkeepers might necessarily be able to be as big or as good. So again, that might maybe level out. I'm not sure, but I suppose again, it comes down to preparing them for the game they're playing now. So at under, so for obviously with scholarship for 16, 19, or preparing them to play against 16, 19 year olds, are we playing? Are we preparing them for the adult game for when they're finished? Mm -hmm. If that answers your question. <laughs> kind of, yeah. So you know how it's like, it's creating an, a, a stat or a number based on like the area of the pitch? Yeah. Does it not take into account, like let's say I'm 12 yards out, but there's four defenders in the way, does it not take that into account at all? Depend on the model. So some do, some of the more complex ones, but like obviously the more generic ones don't necessarily. So I suppose it depends on where you're getting your data and information from. Right. <clears throat> I'm just wondering like how it, how it works in terms of like, so if I'm looking at it as a coach or as even just as a, a spectator and I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, well, that that's it's a stat that informs how my team is performing. Yeah. But then it, it's not taking into account like the, the current state of the game, if that makes sense. Again, I think in, around, in, like that, I'm sure it does take into account if there's like defender in front of you 
if you've got a clear path of goal if it's on your favourite foot? Mm-hmm. Again, though, it depends on the model that you use. So obviously for what we use with scholarship, it's not as technical as that because obviously that requires like a lot of like additional tools. So like obviously for a grassroots model or a more simplified model, it won't necessarily take that into account. Whereas the Premier League, so understanding stuff that way I've got the data from, that is more accurate. So that goes into more detail looks at like obviously the positioning of defenders, the position goalkeeper and like other scenarios like that. And it all depends, Jack, on what like Marshall said, that which company is actually supplying your data because all of the t- all the data supplying companies are, are different. Mm-hmm. The, the models all differ slightly. But I think as long as you're using data from the same company all the time, then it's going to be relative. Right. I think oh, sorry. in terms of stats, um, you can't just present a stat and, and say this is what it means. You've got to have the context to it, like, which is why expected points, it, for me, it means nothing. Like, who, who's to say Brighton should be seventh? Brighton are not seventh because they can't score and they're not good enough. Is that not part of the game? But it's shown that they're getting the ball in the right the right positions and that they are... are they, is it the right positions, though, because they can't score from it? So surely they should be trying something else? But does that like, not maybe suggest that when you look at their... Maybe they need to look at their strikers or maybe it's a case of how they're finishing those chances? Maybe, but there's no... That's what I mean. There's no yeah. clarity on it. It's yeah. like Arteta in his press conference the other week. He's banged on about this model that he has. And everyone's going, well, why doesn't he use expected goals, etc.? If that's what works for him, that what that's what works. But um, I'll not say it to anyone it doesn't work, because I think it's one of them things that you've got to research yourself and, and what do you think of it. But I just think looking at an expected goals like this team should have won this game. There's so many more factors that go into it. Like it's that's just seeing football's all technical, tactical for me. That's not like sort of how it should be looked at it shouldn't be used game by game obviously a 38 game season isn't really long enough to get like all the data like sort of average itself out so like, it needs to be considered longer term so obviously it's not perfect but it's shown that like where the teams where teams are like, getting their chances if that makes sense so if you can get the ball into high extra areas the likelihood of scoring from there is higher if you're preventing the other team from getting high extra areas then they've got less chances of scoring so well, that's, that's been around for years. That's not just this. That's a position of maximal opportunity stuff. And and obviously it's been in the news with Sunderland recently because Lee Johnson loves it. <laughs> obviously there's a reason for that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just yeah yeah. What, what I would I would come in there, Jake, just to say though that but previously you you're right for the you know the second 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 yard box or the the pub or whatever it was called has been there. The, the data always just used to be shots, you know, shots on target, uh, shots on goal, and even uh, a year ago, I think match of the day still just used shots as a, an indicator of, of strong performance. And I think the expected goals is moving away from you know somebody having a pot shot from forty five yards out that dribbles past the post. Is that really that was what teams were using as an indicator of good performance in attacking play until they said probably even about two years ago. Uh, this is to me, is just the next evolution. I'm sure, as, as I think Marshall said, it will get better as, as you know, as, as more and more analysis gets done and the models get stronger uh, in terms of the variables, you know, position of the field, number of defenders, position of the goalkeeper, or left foot, right foot. So it, it's just part of an evolution. But it's moved considerably, I think, in just two years from if somebody had a shot and goal, that was what was getting counted. You know, I think the Charles Hughes winning formula was... Was it seven, six or seven shots on goal? Was on average, was was the stat that was required to get a goal? Uh, you know, so I think in a short space of time, it's it's come a long way in terms of a, a much more detailed descriptor of of whether a team's performing well. So, if you're making high quality chances, that that's better than actually just having shots on goal as a, as an indicator. So, uh, I mean, that's certainly how how I'd read the expected goals. That's it's the you know. I would rather see somebody having a shot from you know a high expected goal rate than somebody having a shot on target. But it's gone from 30 yards with very little chance of beating the goalkeeper, uh, and that's not necessarily an indicator of good build-up play. But a high expected goal opportunity is an indicator. So, uh, but yeah, it's uh, 
it's not for everybody though, I guess, at times. No, it's something that I'd I'd love it. It's like whenever I've done analysis or anything, I've loved the stats about it. But I just I can't get behind it because of the all all of the variables around it. If a player's confident, surely they're more likely to score that chance. If they've been on good form, is that not are you not more likely to score a penalty? If you're someone who's scored, like if I have a penalty against Alisson or Bruno Fernandes has a penalty against one of my under 12s, it's exactly the same. And I just, I can't get away from it. I think the idea though, just quantifies, so it like quantifies how good the area of the chance is and not necessarily how many, like how good the shot is. It'll determine, like, like I say, I don't really think it should be used to, like sort of predict outcomes of matches. I think it's more a case of looking at where the ball gets into and like sort of the chance that's being created instead of like the actual finish. Again, then moving on to expected goals on target, then maybe gives a bit more of a understanding of how likely that goal is to go in to then maybe determine like whether or not you should win a football match. Does that make sense? So in that case, it should be used as a, this is me thoughts, does this back it up or am I thinking the wrong thing? Rather than looking at a stat and going, he should have scored that. Should it? I think, I think it should be paired with a video. So I think, in my ideal world, you should have like an expected goals map and then be able to click on like the dot to then maybe watch the video and then be like, oh well, actually, like this is like this is the actual result. If that makes sense. The the, the other one I would throw in there as well that. Uh... What the expected goals so if somebody's missed a, a good opportunity? What what it often, you know, is indicated is that well, you know, teams not scored is that so the result then becomes the most important indicator of that team's overall performance. But like in the case of Brighton, uh, you actually mentioned Arteta the other day. I mean, when they had that run of four or five games without a win, he kept talking about the stats. So he so he knew that the, the underlying performance indicators weren't as bad as the results were indicating. And if they were to keep producing the same levels of performance, eventually the results will turn around, uh, which I think it has done in the last, the last few weeks for them. So it's always a case of, the, you know, so one strike goes off form, doesn't mean that the whole team are playing badly. But at the moment, I think the, now the general you know, level of punditry would be, well, if teams, they're not scoring goals, the team must be playing poorly. But actually, if they expect the goals is high, but they're still not converting them, is it just down to one individual player and that does so then it's not an influence in the whole team's performance. So you you can um, you can identify well actually the build up play is good, the rest of the play is good, but just got a striker who's not particularly uh, on, on top form at the moment. Uh, but it doesn't mean we're playing badly. But you know, if you, again you listen to the pundits, it's it's a black or white situation. Oh, you're not scoring enough goals, there's not enough attacking threat. Well, actually, maybe it's just one individual that's causing the problems because they're not converting uh, the opportunities. Uh, and I think. Uh, Marshall picked that out, didn't you, with the Brighton one in terms of expected assists? That the expected assist level is really high. So Brighton are putting players in the right areas to score goals, but they're not converting them at the moment. So you, you can identify a different part of the game, but it's not saying that the, all of Brighton's attacking play is bad. It's just maybe one part of it at the moment that you can unpick. Jill, were you going to jump in with something before? I think you were off mute, weren't you? Yeah, I was just going to ask around. Um, I know you said you've used the expected goals theory um, with TC players. Have you done any um, any sort of evidence research with the the WSL teams, and how might that change depending on your Premier League stats? Might look slightly different. Does that change your models and how you approach working with the RTC girls at all? Um, that's not something I've done as of yet. That's definitely something I want to look into because again, obviously, it's going to be different for girls compared to in men's football. So again, maybe the areas that they get into might need to be slightly different. Um, I suppose really yeah. for that case of like getting the, the raw data to be able to draw those conclusions. Yeah, I was just wondering if the the, the like Opta stats was available for that and if it was something that um, you had put together because I'd be, I'd be interested in, in seeing some of it really. But um, thanks for sharing that though, Marshall. I think that um, I... Have never seen expected goals theory before. I've never done anything around it. So thanks for putting yourself out there and um, and sharing that with me. Appreciate. It. 
Um, Marshall, I've got a quick question. Um, you mentioned around how it's probably 38 games isn't long enough. So <clears throat> take the scenario where, say, Sheffield United started using it at the start of the season, but they go down after 38 games. So after that 38 games, do they just continue doing it? Even though that it's after that, obviously the next season they'll be coming up, they'll be going from playing like Van Dyke's, Harry Maguire's, Van der Veerelds, all the top players to maybe like the Jay Coopers and the championship level players. Does does that affect it or does it just continue or do they start again? Or so obviously the way they would expect it to perform would be slightly different based on that. So obviously if you're if you've gone from playing like Liverpool, then going playing championship teams, obviously you would hope being Sheffield United, like you would have a higher expected goals in the opposition would have lower. But like the principles would still be the same thing, trying to get into those high expected goals areas to then be able to create those chances. And it's not necessarily a case that a certain year game isn't long enough. It's just a case of like the more data you've got in the longer period of time, the longer it gives itself to like sort of level out. Even though the quality is different, because obviously like I said, you're going to be going from playing the top end in the Premier League to playing the bottom end of Championship. Even like you'll get the data, but is that data going to be quality data because you're playing a top team and then going to play a Luton, for example? Obviously, it depends on the team you're playing. So, like, obviously, you would expect to have a lower expected goals against Liverpool than you would against Sheffield United. But the like sort of the principles the same sort of thing. You still want to try and get the ball in the same areas. Obviously, maybe if you know you're not going to have as much of the ball, then it might be a case of sort of making those decisions. You still try and get into the highest expected goals areas, or do you maybe then try your luck further out? So again, I suppose with that, it probably comes more down to opposition analysis. So like looking at the team you're playing against, what is the likelihood of being able to get in the box against them? If you can get in the box, if like obviously maybe they use a low block, then if it's one of the top teams using a lower block, then you might need to try and shoot from further out. But then maybe if they're high press, and that might still give you the space like, to break lines and get into the box that way and have shots. I suppose really it just depends on the team you're playing against in terms of the approach you use to get your expected goals. But I suppose you've just got to try and give yourself the best chance of winning. So I think really it needs to be paired with other things. It can't just be, all right, well, we want to get like in areas where we're going to get like 0.88 expected goals with every shot. It might be it might be a case of right. Well, we want our shots to be between on average say 0.5 and 0.75, but that might change based on the teams you're playing because you might not be able to get those chances. If that makes sense. A little bit, yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I'd probably need to go away and think about it. If I'm honest. Anyone else got any questions? No. Uh, Matt, I've got I've got a question. Then obviously, I, I mean, I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, but so we all this all the stats in the whole theory that we've talked about is around like the, the Premier League and, and elite football. How could I use it with uh, either my my local grassroots team that I coach is like that's adults football? Is there a way that it could help me develop my under tens. Like, what's what's the purpose of it for coaches that are working within like a, the grassroots game? Is this is there a way that I can implement it to to help the players? So for me, I think it's just about getting the right areas. So it might be a case of say thinking about getting them to think about that angle where they're shooting from and the way they're creating that shot. Does that make sense? So I did something with my under eights just around where they it was sort of based on expected goals, but wasn't expected goals, if that makes sense. It was on the areas they're shooting in. So are like the angle. So the angle of their shot is so obviously getting close to the goal isn't necessarily always the best thing. So it might be a case of want to be central and want to be close, like centrally, if that makes sense. So we want the goal to be as big as possible and have the shortest distance to travel. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, with coaching, it's necessarily, especially in grassroots, it's more about like the principles themselves. So maybe we want to be showing players where to show the opposition to make them sort of like low XG areas. So obviously, I mean, I know the game isn't the same all the way through, but if you want to develop players to play at the top level and to be the best they can, then having those principles surely will like sort of level themselves out, if that makes sense. It'll like sort of give them the right ideas of where to show players. 
think from one webinar I was on over the summer, uh, Oliver Gage um, works Canadian Premier League. Absolutely loves like all this higher chance of shots and stuff. And, and he did quite a lot around what you would do with the youth team. So you mentioned if you've got a sub on a Saturday, can can they just like dot down on a on a whiteboard at the side every time they have a shot while they're off? And then it comes into half time and you've got that little bit of data. And you would go away and put that over a season for the kids and say like we scored from here, we didn't score from here. Um and I just think it's getting them involved in the process and I know people have coached shot location for years and why are you shooting from there when we could shoot from there. Obviously all of that. But just getting them involved in the process like we would with any other indicator of performance or KPI from from a coach's point of view rather than the stats. So it's still it's still relevant uh, to what we are doing. 100%. Is there, a, is there a danger there though? And I'm not saying I believe this, but I'm just chucking the question out there. Is there not a danger that this takes away creativity for the kids? Like, so we're saying don't shoot, like Jack's reference there was around a grassroots team. So like, the whole purpose of playing grassroots football, like have fun and try things and you know, do something that you wouldn't normally do. So, like, are we not? Is there a danger there that it could take creativity away? Well, look at City when they won the league. If company didn't take that shot because someone had told them not to get the ball in the box, City wouldn't have won the league that year. Again, again, no, I think it's decision making, isn't it? You've got to know when to try it and when not to. So is that not by the theory? Is that not saying you should never try it though? That's just football as well. Football's about making decisions. That's but, not like a theory or a stat. That's that's football. You make decisions. But you want to try and run the ball into the best position you can. And if you can't work it into a better position, then choose. If that makes sense. It, yes, but then there's like you said, like Jake's there saying that. People, even the commentator for companies was saying, "Don't shoot! Don't shoot!" Was Guardiola? Even, even Guardiola was saying, "Don't shoot!" But even though he shouldn't have, and it was a uh, next game to goals would have been higher if he did something else he still scored but and still, um, still went on to win the league but how many times if he took that shot 100 times how many times it going so again is that I, not just the beauty of football it was class yeah 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 <laughs> it is but again it's just that I disagree <laughs> <laughs> that's a Liverpool fan <laughs> <laughs> you've had your day Jamie <laughs> Is it I, is it an argument for being sort of data informed but not driven? So it's good to know the data. It's good to have it to hand, or to be able to, to give your players an idea of where the best um, chances come from, but not always having to stick to that. So informed, but not not necessarily this is the must. This is the exact model. I think that's spot on. I think that's like probably the most important thing. It's not doing everything based solely on the data. You've got to like I say, a look at the decision-making around it as well. So it might be a case of explaining the theory and showing how that looks, but then maybe, again, giving them the freedom. So it's not like if you don't shoot in, like, say, a point eight five expected goals area, they're going to get 12. It might just be a case of looking at, well, was that the best decision that you had? What did you see in that situation? Can I just chirp up? Sorry. Marshall, yeah, obviously that, that's great what you've done there. I fully appreciate it. And obviously it's a, it's a massive thank you for being invited in, really, Jamie and, and everyone. Um, it's all going to be taken into context. It's horses for courses. You know, football is this beautiful game that has millions upon millions of different opinions. It's just backing it up and, and running with it. If you believe in it, you, you run with it. If you don't believe in it, you try something else. You know, Big Sam's way of doing things here is totally different to what Lee Johnson's is. Something to look into possibly will be Aaron Danks leading into the Under-19 World Cup. Um, he's, he's done a massive study on this as well. Not to this degree, Marsh, I think it's great what you've done. But they class it as the, the red triangle, the golden triangle, to try to get in there more. And he has footage of Solanke and them shooting from wild and wonderful places, which is great. And everyone talks about it when it goes in. But the fact they won the World Cup off trying to get one or two more passes into an area... I'm not saying that's right or that's wrong because half the half the callers on here will agree with it, half will disagree with it, like Jake does, which I fully respect and understand. 
not a problem with that at all. Um, and then for me, again, when I worked at the FA, we did an academy study across all the FA YCDs. The hardest thing to do in a game of football is put the ball in the back of the net. Let's, excuse me, guess what the least practised is? Finishing. Shooting. Shooting with context. How often do we have the right size goals for the right goalkeepers and players in, in the right positions to go and shoot instead of just the old adage where you sit on stand on the edge of the penalty area, someone plays a pass into you, set the one side or the other and they just whack the ball as hard as they can at the goalkeeper. So if we're not practising it properly, how are we going to actually execute it in a game? Just things to think about. That that would be all from my perspective, but it's, it's fantastic and I fully respect and understand and the great discussions there. And Moss, I think you've conducted yourself well there because I think there's been some challenging questions put at you and I think you've, had, you've done a great job, to be fair. Thank you. Uh, has anyone got any other questions? If not, I think Marshall might just give us a little a little task to go and try for 10 minutes, just uh, if anybody wants to jump in now with anything else. Oh, brilliant. Uh, so we've got we've got about 25 minutes left just because I've got to go and do a, another Zoom call. Um, Marshall, I'll break people off into, into three breakout rooms if you want. Do you want to sort of give like three different challenges? Um, just based around this. So if you end if you end up in room number one, uh, room number two, and room number three, right? Um, in room, room number one, okay. How might expected goals influence or like the discussed theories influence your train? So how might that influence the way you design a finishing session or something like that? Um, if you're in room number two, how might that influence where you ask players to finish? during the game so how might it finish how might it affect your finishing during a match so say if you are like so what would your game model be so are you asking players maybe to only shoot in certain areas and maybe asking them to think more about one thing than another and if you're in room number three how can it be used to measure performance in that grassroots environment so how could it be used and how then could that be relayed, relayed back to players to give like sort of their ideas Across, if that makes sense. Brilliant. Have you wrote them down, Johnny? Yeah, I've I've written them down, but me and you will just jump in between rooms straight away to, to make sure everyone's everyone uh, has got their task. So we'll spend sort of just like seven or eight minutes, just just have a little bit of a chat about it, and then we'll come back. Obviously, it might give some people some ideas to take away, and then uh, we'll be away by quarter past five. So I'll create those rooms now. You should be sent into a room. If not, just let us know, and I'll I'll try it again. Should have worked. Brilliant. Oh my, Jamie. Keep me out of the texture there. I, I've got a good five. Right. Sound. No worry. No worry. Uh, just don't join them. Unless you want to put us in one and I can just go in there, but I'll, have to, I'll just have to go. I've just got to go and pick the kids up, that's all. Uh, well, it's up to you. Do you want us to chuck you in for a couple of minutes? I uh, just chuck you in. Uh, you should be able to still join room three. that work? I decline it, so you'll have, do you have to re-invite us? Oh, no, yeah. I'm in. There we go. Uh, no, I just jump off whenever. Ain't that tough? Yeah. yeah. Like, I, it's, I think it's different like sort of what you've like what other people are like. uh, it's, it's not easy then, to the coaches like no no, no well, that was good cool. ideas around it as well so it's definitely worth it yeah 100% right we'll get in those rooms in a couple of minutes we'll go up five and then just bring them back in spot if you have those questions that I'll put them in the chat yes uh, so room one do you want to type them in quickly Right, yeah. Room one was how you'd use it to influence training sessions. Room two was influence the areas of the pitch you finish in or try to finish in during a game, I think. And room three was how would you use it in grassroots? I'm going to go to room one first if you go. You should be able to move to any room, is that... Is that like, yeah. yeah, yeah, sound right. I'll go to room one. 
is the sort of players you've got at your disposal as much as much as what the stats say. I don't know, I don't know what your thoughts are, but that's mine. I think if um, <clears throat> I think if you if you buy into the model and obviously you're trying to create more chances um, that you've got a higher expected goals, then you've got to try and get the ball into the box in a different way. For example, so the, are your practices based around getting inside the box? Um, but at the at the byline, and you you practice is more around pullbacks um, mm. and stuff like that. Is that is that part how you um, how you get and then work backwards? So that might be the end finish practice. So that might just involve a couple of the forwards and the midfielders in combinations and pullbacks and timing runs. And then how do you get it to that player in that situation? So your next bit mm. is how do I create that finishing bit and then then work backwards. And is that a way that it informs your practice by how you actually want to finish in the end? So would that be a, like rotation of the ball to, to pull out the defenders from the areas that you want to put the ball in? I just think there's loads of scenarios, isn't it? It's just coming yeah. up with the, like the areas right. of the pitch that you want to be in and then all the, the potential possibilities. So like they can be structured to it, then there could be like different parts to it. But I think if, if you're going to go by, you know, trying to create a certain certain chances, then in the end, you have to try and create those. And you can only create those by maybe getting into certain areas. I think on that, again, you've probably got to be quite specific around your personnel. Because, you, you know, it, ultimately, it's talking about getting getting the ball in the right areas. For example, if I've got a, a big centre forward, I might look to cross from deep, as opposed to maybe smaller smaller forwards, where I might be looking to get, get the ball into the box. But there's a different way of doing that. So again, I think it's very personnel um, sort of driven um, around the theory. So again, the type of players, your your style of it, I think that that's important. Would you do that? Would you do that though? If then that information said that you got the ball in the box but you didn't score? Uh, no, yeah, it's, it's a good point. Um, I just think that there's sort of more, more than one way. I think just getting the ball in into areas is still quite a a broad broad scenario as opposed to being. I just think that there's more more than one way that that can be done. It doesn't necessarily just have to be ball into the box. There's you know there's different ways of of how that can be done. I'm guessing we could actually work with that um, number when you have a striker that has. Look at it. On an individual level for your training. Well, how would I would also get think, as an example. Oh, sorry, go on, Wayne. No, go on, go on, Jill. I was just going to say, as a um, as a model for younger players looking up to some of these like professional players as role models, or whoever's playing it in the position that they prefer to play in, looking at um, like expected goals for if you, if you're saying to them, go and analyse their performances. It's probably quite a good model to, to get them to look at in terms of where they're scoring from, what happens beforehand, what movements do they need to make when, what what the triggers. Um, so things that, that you could ask them to look at in that sort of model, just taking it kind of out of context in a team, but in an individual kind of environment. I agree. Is that what this does at the minute? Um, I think it. I think it could be used as a um, as a tool to sort of start to identify that. So, um, yeah. if you if you've got certain players who desperately want to play in those positions, um, can can they just be really drilling down into what that detail looks like? How that can sort of. It might not be just looking at the stats. It might be going into to a lot of the videos, but it might give them something to try and build a model of their own from. So how do we get it to influence matches then? Or how do we influence, use it to influence finishing in matches? So I've done, with the adults a little bit, one or two players I've done, there's a website called Understat where it shows where where you get shots off from. You know, if you like, it's this XJ map of the size of the circle names the goal and that but it's literally just if you just put it on goals you can see every shot for the last however many years of where players scored from so we did it with a, a striker who 
kept going wide to shoot. And it was like, look at, I don't know which players we used. I think it was uh, Salah, Mania. Even though they started out wide, they came inside and they were shooting in between the posts, like you said about like Calvert Lewin. And that, it's just about trying to like drip feed it in and get a, them to make a, a conscious decision in training and matches to try and try and take better shots. But I just think if you put the number with it, it takes away from the game. Okay. All right. All right. I think we'll probably get some good discussion here, but I'm going to have to cut it. So. <laughs> I've got this Q&A with Bailey, right? That'll be interesting. All right, we've got the kids coming on. There's about 40 kids coming to ask questions, so that should be good. Is that, is that being done like across all age groups? Aye, uh, just PDC yeah. kids. Class. And then Lauren Hemp tomorrow, isn't it, for RDC? Aye. Uh-huh. I know people, you know. <laughs> get, get in with the right people. Will it record what's been discussed in the breakout rooms or will it just be this? I think, it, I think it records whichever one I was in. So I went in two. Right. I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> we'll see. There we go. Is that everyone back? No. Brilliant. Uh, right, breakout room number one. You got a volunteer for someone just to sort of feed back around how you might use the expected goals theory to influence training. I mean, uh, after the discussion, I just I just had a question right now that popped into my head. Uh, is is the so if you look at the uh, highest, the best area uh, for finishing, like where the expected goal start is like the highest from. I'm guessing that'll be like a second six yard box. On the goal Does line. It... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good challenge. It will be. Yeah, so that's that's what I was that's what I'm thinking. So how does it differentiate if you look at the penalty box? Uh where are those best areas um for this stat to be as high as possible? So closer to the goal. Is it, is it actually the is it actually the goal line? Yeah. Yeah. So like right. Okay. The aim is to work this like sort of as close to the goal line as possible. So if you think the Spurs is first two goals in the FA Cup of the weekend, like yeah. those XGs would be a lot higher than like the other goals in that game. Because again, it's just close to the as close to the goal line as possible, with like obviously gives you the highest chance of scoring. But at the same time, those areas are the hardest to work the ball into. I suppose it's like really risk versus reward in terms of like how far do you want to work and where do you shoot and where do you 
make look to try and build further. Yeah, because I think the general thought was that you, you kind of you need to consider what what your team is like and what players you've got. Um, but yeah, I mean it's it will be interesting to involve the the start in the training session, but yeah, it's not uh, it's not it's not uh, if if you consider that the goal line is the best place it uh, would be interesting to, to like kind of design the session with that stat in mind. Definitely it might be a case of like how do you work the ball in that position so it might not necessarily be shooting but it might be more something like how do we create how do we like sort of build play like how do we get those areas I suppose is how, like what's the best way to get in those positions. Yeah. Anything else yep. from room number what, one? What, yeah, one, one, one thing I know from working with the uh, sort of a, a, a mix of built grassroots uh, football team is that uh, one of the surprising things actually expected goals quite close to goal are actually lower than people think. So uh, the, the amount of times you hear, obviously, again, the, 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 the pundits are coming to say, oh, I can't believe he's missed that. But actually, if you see the expected goal model from some of these positions, they're a lot lower than you expect. You know, five yards out with a ball coming across the face of the goal on the half volley is a much harder technique uh, to, to put in the back of the net, particularly under a bit of pressure than, than you'd expect. Uh, the, the stats actually, uh, you know, the expected to goal sh show you that. Yet most of your shooting practices that coaches run tend to involve a striking goal from a layoff near the edge of the box. But actually, hitting the strike of the ball from six or seven yards out is probably more likely... Uh, to happen in a game and and actually the, the success rate uh, is a lot lower than I think most people expect from those expected uh, goals uh, you know there's always anecdotes of the you know missing from two or three yards out but it's surprisingly uh, it happens quite regularly uh, and I always tell the players even if we're playing five small sided games with no goalkeeper in the goal always hit the back of the net never expect it because expect the goal is never a uh, 1.0 you know as you can tell the kids love my coaching sessions <laughs> when, I'm, uh, when, I, when I'm using stats at them, but always hit the back of the net because it's amazing how often uh, even top pros will miss from three or four yards out under the slightest bit of pressure. Interesting stuff. Uh, room two, did you guys have any sort of discussion around the area of the pitch that you would try to work the ball into? We did. We pro the first thing we probably decided to do was to tell all of our players if Lewis was in our team and he was thinking of shooting, that our, his own teammates had to tackle him because it was probably the best way of keeping the ball in play. Is that right, Lewis? Me. <laughs> what was your XG? Mine, very little. <laughs> So a bit higher than mine. Aye, probably. Yeah. Uh, we talked about probably, I don't know if it, it's the right example, or, but it was something we talked about, about I think what Everton did with Calvert-Lewin, where they told them to stay between the the width of the penalty box. Um, to obviously focus them on being in the be better areas to, to get chances to score. Uh, obviously looking at... Again, depending on what type of players players you've got. So, if if it's an Aguero, it's getting the ball into into the areas in and around the box where he's going to be more he's most effective. Uh, which may obviously be different from somebody like a Giroud, where you you potentially maybe he's getting the ball wide to deliver crosses from wide. Um, so they were the sort of the areas that we we talked about. But I think with it, it would all depend on the types of player that you have um, as to how you would then play the game and, and set your team up to play. If anybody else wants to add anything from the, the group. No? I'll be that, <laughs> You've nailed it all. <laughs> I found it quite interesting. I, obviously, just thinking back to earlier, when you've talked about players there, how like Giroud 
I think you said Marshall has quite a low expected goals or something like that, but actually, like he's he's really prolific with his head on, like how the, how the staff doesn't necessarily take into account the type of player or like the type of finish that the best at. I find that quite interesting. Um, I don't know if that links to the, what they they just talked about there. Definitely, it's just it's like plenty of I suppose plenty of strength. So it's like obviously it's a generic statistic that shows like the closer that you get, the better chance you've got of scoring. But then again, it can compare like where like where you're scoring to compare to where the average player does. Mm-hmm. So I suppose again, things like that as well. So obviously you is typically like the type of player that you'll bring on like maybe last half hour or so if you need a goal because he's he's good with his head so he can work balls in the box and he can play off that. Whereas if you're going to maybe play on the floor or maybe looking to play a different style where it's maybe more like sort of shots with, I think he was particularly weak with his right foot. So like if you're, then you're looking to play on your right foot, then maybe it would be better having someone else playing, if that makes sense. It might be different players for different styles and different, like, sort of times of the match. Yeah. I mean, this, this, I'm going to raise another question. This isn't something I've got a great knowledge or understanding of, but is, is are there any models that take into account things like the time in the game or the score? No. Or how I that would affect so. the... Yeah, definitely. That's, like, again, I suppose same with, like, play conference and stuff like that all has an impact. Obviously, you can view it on like different ways of explaining it. So again, like where it was like sort of the time graph, that obviously shows it, but there's not really much like that doesn't influence the figure, if that makes sense. Marshall, is the does the fella from Brentford that has the betting company, does he not got his own system? Yeah, that's um Benham from Smart Odds. Yeah. He has his own system and he has guys who do like a personal evaluation of each one. Yeah. And so they add extra to it. Which makes their data a little bit more enhanced, but you pay a bigger price to get the data. Yeah, I, yeah, I believe for a recruitment point of view that they, you know, a lot of the, the clubs that use analysis will, will use the stage of the game to add that extra layer. So yeah, so you know, they might find that they want the pick of striker who's got uh, overperforms, you know, expected goal uh, data, but then they break it down in terms of uh, are they, you know, do do they score? As expected, goals from the scores level the same as when they're one goal up, or when they're the same as uh, two or three goals up. I'm, I'm sure it's, it's the numbers game where they do a bit of uh, one of the chapters actually called the shooter bought Darren Bent. Uh, and I'm trying to remember which team it was that turned down Darren Bent when he was at Sunderland and went and bought uh, Fernando Torres. That must have been Chelsea actually because they bought Torres for Liverpool. But actually, if they looked at the expected goals, Darren Bent was completely outperforming what Fernando Torres had been doing in his last few few months at Liverpool. Um, and they used expected goals uh, theory just to show why you know, Darren Bent would have been a far better signing uh, for uh, for Chelsea than Fernando Torres was uh, at the time. So, uh, uh, but that's I guess that's how you can get to that next level when uh, you know you you can pick one player and then you can look at well, and that was because Darren Bent played for Sunderland, had to score most of his goals from the, when there was when there was very little goals in it. You either a goal down, all square, or only a goal up. Whereas a lot of Fernando Torres' goals were the, the cheap ones when they were two, three, four nil up. Uh, so although he got a lot more goals, he didn't score as many goals when the game situation uh, required them uh, as much as well. So uh, there, there has been data done on that, and I'm, I'm going to try and point. I'm sure it was a numbers game book. Uh, it's got a whole chapter on on strikers that actually are better when the score line is, is really tight. Uh, but they and it's that money ball approach because they tend to be undervalued by the transfer market uh, and what they go for is overall goals but if you graded goals in terms of the worth so a goal when it's nil-nil in the last 15 minutes is worth more than a goal when a team's 3 nil up but actually the way that the system works at the moment are those players get exactly the same value in fact scoring goals 4, 5 and 6 get the headlines because they scored a hat-trick whereas actually a player who scores the one goal in a 1-0 win should get more credibility but uh, it, was, it was certainly used there was a chapter there was a whole chapter on it in the book because so, uh, these are the players that, that you can really recruitment can, can unpick uh, and, and make a lot of money on uh, and actually that was very much the money ball approach for finding something that's uh, a discrepancy in the, in the free market uh, and you can exploit it for your own use
quite a lot. Sorry, Jack, I hijacked you there, didn't I? <laughs> no, it's uh, it's interesting. Like, I'll be honest, I'm still trying to get my head around it. I'm glad we've we've spent the time speaking about it. Um, uh, it's give it's probably let me leave with more questions than than answers, to be honest, Marshall. So I'll probably be picking your brains a little bit more. Uh. Room number three, do you guys want to just give any ideas around how you might use to measure it in, in grassroots before we, we shoot off? Uh, yeah, we kind of, we just spoke about how, obviously because of um, the resources or lack of resources you might have, it would be quite difficult to do. So anything you did wouldn't be in um, too great a depth, but you'd, you'd probably focus, you'd, you'd strip it back more. So you might just look at... Um, we used the example I think it was given earlier of uh, just getting the subs to to note down on a board where shots came from, where goals came from. So you'd be looking to just kind of drip feed and educate players around, um, help them improve their decision making around where goals tend to come from, without stifling their creativity or their individuality. Um, so you'd have a lot more kind of shot map um, work as opposed to XG. Um, that we had a little bit of a discussion around whether you would use numbers in there. We probably said you wouldn't. Um, you'd have less focus on that just to try and not overcomplicate it. Um, you could probably use it as a as a team tool rather than for individuals as well, especially um, depending on age group you're working with, where there'll be a lot more at the younger age, there'll be a lot more um, sort of position rotation. So you'd struggle to, to use it for individuals as much. Good stuff, some good ideas. Uh, I'm going to have to cut it short and sort of finish it there just because I've got a, another Zoom call starting in 10 minutes um, with a group of kids, so I best not be late. Uh, just to sort of wrap up then, hopefully, like like me, you're going to leave with more questions than answers. Um, and I found that really interesting. If anybody in the future or like even as, as close as next week wants to pick a topic or lead a discussion on the coffee club, then please just give us a message. Um, I'm certainly not a credible enough coach to sit and lecture people so I just want it to be an, inf an informal chat really where we get together and pick something and have a discussion so if anyone's got any ideas just, just send them through and we'll, we'll get together again next week if people want to um, and then last of all Marshall massive thanks to you because I know I've spoke to you over the last week and you've you've been absolutely bricking it to be fair but I thought I thought you were class mate so the, the detail was unreal that the way you delivered it was class so thanks a lot mate and hopefully we'll uh, we'll see everybody yeah. again next week Cheers, all right Marshall. Cheers, Marshall. Cheers, Marshall. Cheers, Marshall. Cheers, Marshall. Cheers, Marshall. Cheers, Marshall. Cheers guys. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers.